Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from howtodrawcomics.net and bartonbrostudios.com. I am joined today by the one and only Eric Kennedy, our very special Hello. guest that we've invited onto the show. How are you doing today, I'm Eric? Doing well. Thank you for having me, dude. Well, we were just we were just having a little chat in the background there. We noticed that it was uh, it was getting about time, you know, StreamYard. It cuts <laughs> off our uh, our show after Is it a little really? while. We were getting carried away as usual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. That's the way these interviews usually go is uh, you can just, I can talk fit to you forever for some reason. Uh, it's, we end up talking about process and making up stuff. And I think we're both sort of keyed into that uh, frequency, right? We mm -hmm. get into the noodly stuff and then we go like, oh, we haven't been drawn for like an hour and a half, you know? We do. Yeah. yeah. I think it's because we love thinking about drawing as much as actually drawing. Yeah, for um, sure. You know, there's... There's just so much philosophy that goes into it as well as the technical side, I think. Okay. And even though, of course, and how to draw comics, the website and, and in maybe your streams as well, I have to admit I haven't seen that many of them. I probably should just to no, educate right, myself. No, that's okay. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the philosophical stuff, it's, it's not covered as much as the technical stuff. For sure. And uh, I think the way that you think about art, the place that you come at it from, uh, can be really important in order to stay disciplined, stay motivated, and to really know exactly what direction you want to take it in. You know, what, what is your end goal? Why are you doing this? Because that's not a technical question. That's sure. a, it's a question of legacy and ambition. For sure, 100%. Um, all right, let's take a look at the chat. So we've got a lot of people here who have been looking forward to, to seeing you today. Corey That's Barton, right. of course, as always, uh, the other half of the Barton Bros duo. Albino Thunderbuns. Um, where are all the Aussie women at? I don't know, man. <laughs> I would love to know that as well. Uh, we've got the Replicator who is, I mean, you already know he's a really big fan of you, Eric. Oh, he hooked us up I'm, in the first place. I, I, I adore Rob. He, is, he has been such a huge proponent of my work, uh, not any less than you have been. But, um, yeah, any time that I need to be able to turn to somebody and say, is this a stupid idea when it, when it has anything to do um, uh, crowdfunding or, you know, self-publishing related, Rob has been an invaluable, endless resource. So thanks to Rob always. Hell, yeah. And uh, we've got Johnny Cole. How you doing? Dom going, Gomez. Dude? Yeah, yeah. Um, Praetor7, cool, mm -hmm. I'll borrow mm -hmm. ideas, and the one and only Chris Cranham, one of our, our biggest fans, love Chris, he's a, yeah. he's a good, good guy, <laughs> right thanks on. man, I, I took off the beanie today, um, even though my hair is thinning out and I will soon have a style much more like Eric's, um, <laughs> yeah. I thought, well, you know what, catch I, up. Yeah, I should use it. I should use it while I've got it. You know. Yeah. Did uh, did everyone compliment the amazing background that you have going, man? <laughs> Look how amazing that looks. That's such I don't an. Think that's, noticed yet. <laughs> that's an incredible upgrade that's going on back there. It looks so. It looks so professional. Well, thank you. You know, I, I do it for the for the viewers really because they've had to put <laughs> up with this weird uh, warehouse looking backdrop from me yeah. for the last few weeks just because yeah. it's taken me forever to get this set up so i set aside some days finally you know that's hard to do as, yeah. a, as an artist who just wants to draw all the time uh but i did it and it's a long process one day i'll have to do just a video on all the crazy stuff i had to go through to get yes. to this point because absolutely i don't know I what it is well about this year I think it's oh, well worth for people who've never had to set up their own, you know, areas mm -hmm. before to add to that level of professionalism, right? To understand how much work goes behind it. Because if they, I think they had an inkling, they just go back to webcams and little tiny, like, you know, little tiny microphones, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. But as we were talking about, it's, it is definitely uh, worth it, I think, when, uh, you're there for the viewers. You want to make sure that you're producing yeah. quality content for them. For and sure. uh, that means everything from the visuals to the voiceovers uh, to the actual demonstrations that you're doing. Yeah. Yep. Um, 
But then, you know, you see some people on YouTube who get away with uh, just slapping a video together and it gets yeah. thousands yeah. and thousands of views and people love it. The realness <laughs> of it, maybe. It all, it, I think it all just comes down to preference in your style, right? Like, you, I think mm -hmm. if I've un come to understand uh, a lot, the way you approach your business, your brand, there's definitely a polish to it that a lot of people don't appreciate. But I can okay. look and be like, oh, yeah, this guy takes the time to make sure. Just the production value is mm -hmm. very, very high, you know? Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing my best to, to maintain that as time goes on. I think uh, once you've, you know, really achieved a, a big, big goal of yours, it can be difficult to, you know, keep that going and to keep pushing it. You know, you finish one course, it's amazing. Yeah. What, do you do another course that's just as amazing or even more sure. amazing? For sure. Um, yeah. And it's like, yeah, you, you have to, to, to keep that reputation going. Yep. Um, but also yep. innovating and thinking about where you want to take things next. How do you serve the people who want to learn this stuff in a, in a better, more effective way? And that's definitely yeah. something that, uh, you know, I have to talk to you about that later, actually. I've got a few ideas floating around. Yeah. There. Well, I mean, in line with what you said earlier, sometimes I think there is a, uh, a saturation, I don't want to say oversaturation, of like really vital critical information to do um, the kind of stuff that you're teaching. But it goes back to that first thing that you brought up, which is sometimes I don't know if I've seen too many videos out there and it might not be in the instructional version either of like th the thinking behind shot selection, the thinking behind the process. There aren't that mm. many. And I don't know why that is. I think maybe it's because, um, you know, people don't know how to exactly verbalize what's going on in their heads. They just kind of go through the motions of it and it becomes sort of this thing that they do. But to have them explain it to you, which I think is super mm. critical for somebody who's learning beyond just the technical, because the technical is easier, right? This is how you draw lighting. This is how you draw rocks. This is how you render grass, that mm. kind of a thing. That you, that's easily learnable. But the but the stuff between your ears kind of stuff, that's so much harder to get out of people, you know, to mm -hmm. be like, why did you pick that shot? Why does that composition yeah. make sense? Right. Mm -hmm. Why did those sequence of shot make you feel of it? Or like, what are you trying to make me feel by setting up those shots in that particular sequence, in that particular ratio next to each other, you know, especially when it comes to comics, right? Yeah. Big time, man. And, yeah. and again, that, and on the surface, that seems like just a way of thinking that some people have and some people don't, but sure. really when you start to break it down, that the whys of the decisions that these artists make, these yeah. sequential artists, and, and this goes for covers as well, pinups, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, how you compose a scene, it, it comes down to, okay, why are you composing in that way? Is it the message that you want to get across? Is it the sure. feeling that you want the sure. viewer to have when they experience it? Yeah. And, and there's certain things that you can do within a shot to cultivate those feelings and emotions and those effects within the viewer, those Absolutely. And, and the way in which they engage with it. You know, just as a really quick example, if you want a the viewer to feel intimidation for one character or another, you know, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. to, to, to make that character appear small and as though they're going to, they're, they're in danger of some kind. For sure. Well, yeah. you can make them very, very small in the composition. Maybe there's an, an overtowering villain, which is, um, you know, uh, Tower, yeah, towering over them, yeah, and, and encroaching yeah. upon them, yeah. Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe it's from the uh, the villain's point of view, and they're looking down onto your protagonist, and the protagonist just feels so insignificant and tiny. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, so you know, it, it just simple things like that to an extent. Yeah, but to add to that as well, like in the example that you gave, I don't know if there's too much. Uh, there's too much insight on the emotive nature of how you draw a pose, right? Mm. Like posing a character, everything that you said is in line. Everything you said is, yep. is absolutely correct. But then the next level, I believe, is somebody who can land um, drawing a pose or a character in a position, just the way they shift their weight, the way they broaden their shoulders or tilt their head. It mm. really does keep nailing, you know, hammering that nail on the head of that intimidation 
concept that you were just talking about. Right? Oh yeah. It's of course it can be done through composition and through like, you know, yeah. relative, um, relative, uh, you know, size to each other. But then you start posing somebody in a very specific way and boy, does it just layer on that extra intimidation, just the way the, mm -hmm. maybe even the way the, just the brow shifts, you know, the, and I don't know if people think about that stuff. There's a way that if you mm -hmm. look at everything like m good movies silently, and oh, yeah. you can immediately understand like, holy crap, that's a very, very intense scene. I can't hear the music. I can't hear the dialogue. I can't hear co context. But just the way that guy is posing right now, the way he's angling himself, is, is it, it speaks volumes to the thing that you're trying to do. And I think comics mm -hmm. does that, right? It is, the, it is the snapshot of the most idyllic moment to communicate that emotion. Mm. Right? And some that's people don't know how to capture it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Comics should do that. They allow yes. you to be able to do Absolutely. that. And uh, I 100% agree with you, man. And I'm a big movie buff myself. Yeah. Um, I, and I'm always thinking of it in that way. Like, why did they pick that shot? Yeah. And and observing the, the body language of a character. And the reason that that is so potent is because in day-to-day -day life, we're sub-communicating this stuff and the way we hold Absolutely. ourselves. And Absolutely. we're picking it up from other people. It's, Absolutely. It's why even though nothing might be said between you and another another person, you'll either like them or you'll feel uncomfortable around mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. um, for no other reason than maybe it's a slight uh, micro movement within th their face or, or just yeah. the way that they're holding their posture. Yeah, you know, there, there's a There's a brilliant clip on YouTube that uh, uh, most of you will be able to look up, actually, which is of the Christopher Reeves Superman going from his Clark Kent posture to mm -hmm. his Superman posture. Mm -hmm. And there mm -hmm. is such a significant contrast between how you feel about the two, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Here's his dweeby Clark Kent kind of nerdy guy. And right. then he's, he's you know, being Superman, building up the courage to propose to, to Lois or, or whatever it is he's about to do. Yeah. And chest out, you know, Stomach yeah. in looks yeah, like a completely different person. It's crazy. It. The other layer to that, and I don't know if you think about this at all, but I'm sure you do. But there are some times when you read the dialogue, and the dialogue obviously has intent or else it wouldn't be on the page, right? You look mm. at the dialogue and you're like, oh, I get it. I get what they're trying to say, either how exciting or how nervous they are or how whatever, the, whatever the intent of the scene in the dialogue is. And then you go and take a look at the person and how they drew them. And it doesn't service the dialogue. And it's so yeah. heartbreaking to me because I'm like, that's such an easy pose. That's like posing 101. That's like emotion 101. Mm -hmm. You know, that's literally the emoji with the two dots in the eyes and the big sad face. Totally. But you're like, oh, why can't you land that very simple concept? Mm -hmm. And I don't know what happened in the, uh, it's done less and less these days. And I don't know if it's because time and schedules won't allow for it or comic yeah. book illustrators are not so keen to pick up on it that that's a skill set that they need to develop. They know how mm. to do the big over the top stuff, right? Because that stuff is great. That stuff is like mm. sexy and exciting and it really catches the eye. But it's also the other things that help sell the story and the, the narrative that I think yeah. needs to be buffed up in a lot of things that I've seen recently. I'm, I'm diving back into comics again, stuff that I've missed for the past five years. And I'm reading it and I'm like, that should be more impactful based on this thing that I've that I'm looking at in the picture, you know? And that's, that's one awesome. that's one of the things that I've come to identify is like they need to shore that up, man. That needs to be more of a priority for people. Yeah, a hundred percent, man. And who knows what the reason is. It's it's difficult to say. I think it's something that um is apparent across the board. And it's yeah. really weird, right? Because there's so much of the tools that would have been difficult to get a hold of uh, back when we were coming back up in the game. Sure. For me, it was the the uh, you know late two thousands, maybe. Sure. sure. Um, you know, but you know everything back in the the two thousands and then the, the uh, even the nineties. If you wanted to make a video game, if you wanted to make a comic book, if you wanted mm -hmm. to, to make a movie, it was mm -hmm. very very expensive <clears throat> and near impossible to do. Yeah. Um, but you had a lot of people back then who were super driven to make it work and they yeah. they made it work. You know, yeah. some of the, the legends of our time came out of those eras. For sure. For but sure. now, 
uh, we've got you know the Unreal Engine, for example, in the the video game industry, completely yeah. free to use. Yeah. Um, yeah. You've got. I mean, you can create a movie on your freaking phone these days. It's yeah, mental. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. of course, what we're doing with crowdfunding comics is is something that. I mean, it's it's a pinnacle point within the history of comics. I, I really I do believe that that we're I going agree to. I agree with that one hundred percent. I agree. Yeah. Um, but it feels like there's at the same time so many people out there who are either half assing their attempt at that opportunity or not taking mm. it up at all. And Let me, I'll propose yeah, this ahead. if you don't mind interrupting. I'll propose this. The the tools have become more sophisticated, easier to access, and seemingly easier to to understand, right? Mm. Yeah. But just because it's being handed to you in sort of a on a spoon. It doesn't make the in, it doesn't take away the onus on the individual to still get good at that craft. Absolutely, right? the tool the tool is just a tool, right? So yeah. you were referring to the early two thousands. For me, it's like the early nineties, right? The things that you you and I had access to, maybe have were probably a bit more crude, a lot less yeah. sophisticated, right? But certainly, yeah. it's still it was still on us to go like, okay, I I don't have Unreal, but I do have mm. this. You know this book that have that has you know anatomy for artists in it how do for i sure. then deconstruct that so that it's usable for me i think what's happening is that things have become so readily available mm -hmm. that it's almost like people could people just expect to just take it out of the resource and put it directly into their work rather than understanding the the purpose of the resource mm -hmm. and then changing it into the, or, you know, using it, utilizing it in such a way that it's reflective of their own voice, as opposed to just like a one-to-one -one transfer, you know? Absolutely, man. Yeah. I think as well, it, it might be a determination thing. So, you know, I mean, I was talking about setting up the studio before, but it applies yeah. to, to my artwork and, and almost everything I do. There's, yeah. you know, setting up how to draw comics, setting up Barton Bros, doing yeah. the campaign for Kozor. There's about, uh, there's hundreds of obstacles in the way of every single one of those things that I set oh, out for to sure. do. For sure. And it's it's no doubt the same for you. It's no doubt the same for anybody that we look at and go, man, look at what they've achieved. Yeah. Um, and if any of us had had given up on that first obstacle or that second obstacle or even that tenth obstacle, uh, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be where we are today. Sure. Sure. And so you've kind of, you, you have to be a little bit uh, insane to an extent. Um, <laughs> sure. you, you know, you, you've got to yeah. really have uh, a lot of belief and faith behind what it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it can seem like the, the freaking universe is working against you sometimes. But yeah. you know what? You've just got to beat that universe back into line. And, yeah. uh, and carve out your own path sometimes, yeah. regardless yeah. of how many how many obstacles rock up before you i have i have similar thoughts to that not identical right to, to the universe thing that you just brought up mm. i i think things are set up depending on the kind of personality that you are things yeah. are set up at least for me from my perspective things are set up yeah. for me to succeed right the thing that Same. is a preventative right the thing that is the preventative is my overall attitude and approach on what that success looks like Right. So mm -hmm. if I decide that that's not worth my time, inevitably and inherently, that thing is going to fail. Right. But if I yeah. say, you know what, I'm going to learn how to do this, even though ultimately I don't end up doing it for myself. A perfect example is, you know, when you're crowdfunding, you've got to think of fulfillment. And when you are thinking about just making the book, producing it and getting it out to, um, you know, your fans. Right. That's much as far as your business acumen goes. You're like, dude, I'm going to draw it. I'm going to letter it. I'm going to color it. I'm going to print it. And then it's going to be out in the world, right? But the reality is that's when you take off that particular hat and then you put on the yeah. other one, which is how do you get this book into the hands of the people who are kind enough to support you? I totally. knew nothing about that, right? Mm -hmm. And the more I learned, the more I'd come to, re I'd come to appreciate that space of like somebody mm -hmm as actually doing this out of their own garage. And I understand why people are late in as far as your fulfillment is concerned, right? Yeah. But it gave me an appreciation. So when I reached out to somebody and said, will you fulfill this, this project for me, right? Mm. It gave me that curiosity to understand why they're successful at it. 
because yeah. they're fully dedicated to this thing that I myself am not dedicated to. Does that make sense? Gotcha. So, there, so okay. everything is set up for me to succeed until I yeah. say, I don't want to be successful at that. Right. Yeah. And then hand off the reins to somebody else who's, you know, that's in their well, that's in their wheelhouse. You know what I mean? Absolutely, man. Yeah. I totally get that. Yeah. And it's, it's really difficult to do it all on your own, no, uh, especially sure. when there's a component to what you have to do that uh, you're not really that into. And so yes. you do get a lot of creatives out there who are like, well, I, I love the creating part, yep. but as far as marketing and promotion and all that other stuff, yes. Yes. I really don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've had conversations with people offline about, X, Y, and Z creator and why they haven't taken a leapt into create your own books, crowdfunding books. And you have to theorize that part of it is exactly what you said, which is mm -hmm. they are, their success, their peace of mind, their whatever, their well-being is contingent upon that built-in infrastructure in the industry that they're in. Because outside totally. of it, they are not, they're not going to be successful at it. They're either because they're no good at it or they're just not interested, you know? So it's better for them to be successful in that environment so oftentimes when i see a bunch of my friends who are like you know in in you know doing stuff for the mainstream and i always say like gosh you could be so much better off invested in your own property than doing the mainstream trade marketed registered character but then i yeah. realize oh they would fail at this you know it's comfortable to be in that space because a lot of the lifting is done by somebody else right big time man yeah, so, yeah, you, you exactly. And, it, again, it, it depends what your goal is as well. Yeah, um, for sure. I think if, if your own IP is, is that important to you, you'll do whatever it needs to happen in order to make it successful. So you'll do the marketing. Mm. Even, even if you don't necessarily like it, you'll learn to like it because you know, mm. hey, this is, this is what I need to do in order to reach that ultimate goal and yeah. to, to get this book in people's hands so that they can enjoy it and stuff. And, you know, there, there is things sometimes that, that you don't want to do that you just, uh, uh, then again, it's funny cause I kind of like the marketing side of things as well. Yeah. Which is, yeah. I'm very You're wired for it. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was like, going to say, there's no way you can't like, or you not can't not like it because you know, you yeah. do, you, you're doing the, the online courses, you know, that's, you almost have to be built for that kind of endeavor. And part of that endeavor is marketing your own stuff, you know? Yeah, big time. And, and, you know, marketing does get a, a bad rap for sure. I've always mm. seen it as just, I have this cool thing and yeah. I need to tell you that I have this cool thing for you yeah. to enjoy it. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's how marketing. I think of it. <laughs> yeah, basically, basically. Yeah. Um, so, you know, th th that goes for anyone who has a kick-ass comic book that they want to sell or, you know, a course or whatever it is that they're working on. Uh, it's cool to be able to create something amazing, but if you haven't told anybody about it, uh, sure. they're never going to be able to experience. So it's almost like it's almost like uh, you owe it to them, really, mm, to, mm. to market it well That's and to help them understand that it's as, as amazing as it is. Yeah, yeah. For this particular right. project, it's funny that you mentioned that when you say like, you really believe in your own IP and therefore you're compelled to talk to people about it, right? Yeah. And I thought about that as you were saying it and I thought like, I don't know, I've never given Arkathena a concept of like whether or not I believe in it. I'm having fun doing it, right? Mm. But me doing the project was to simply shut myself up from all of the overly criti critical things that I say about all the properties that exist out there. I got sick of hearing myself say it out loud to people. Oh, you yeah. want to know what's wrong with this movie? It's this. You want to know about this particular comic book? Mm -hmm. It's this. And I heard myself, I think one too many times listening to those VODs from my friend's yeah. streams. And I go like, listen to this jerk, you know? Yeah. Like, just just do the thing, right? If you have so many great answers, you think you so you can do so much better. Then mm -hmm. just do that thing and prove yourself out. So I think more than anything, I think in this particular case, more than anything, it's me trying to proof out all the things that I was talking about rather than just be like, you know, sitting back and, you know, uh, they say like, you know, like armchair quarterbacking certain things. <laughs> I see a lot yeah. of critics who step into the space going, oh, you know how you could have made that better. 
not yeah. realizing that they're starting with this thing that's already prefabricated and now they can kind of shape it and mold it. But when you're starting with a blank sheet of paper, it's so much more difficult, right? And so oh, for yeah. me, I wanted to go figure what that space looks like. So to go back to what you were talking about, I was like, am I really ultimately passionate about Arcathena? I think for all the things that, that not really like is about the hype behind it, but because I mm -hmm. love drawing it, and I put myself yeah. in a space in which I can love drawing it. You know what I mean? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, so with Arc Athena, what do you love most about it? The drawing it or the, um, or what you were just talking about, uh, being able to, being able to construct something that, uh, like being able to walk your talk essentially. Yeah. That's part of it. Right. And a lot of that walking and talking comes from what I love about Arcathena the most is character development. Cool. I love like showing character arcs, most importantly, setting up an expectation to the audience of like, oh, you understand who this character is. And it either stays consistent or you feel like, oh, there's growth happening here. Right. What I love the most is when I'm reading a character and it's easier to do with movies because actors do their job very well if they're doing their job very well it's yeah. consistent right they have the same voice they have the same cadence in the way they talk they you know what i mean they're delivering those lines the way that character has oh excuse me the way that actor has decided to deliver those lines but in the comic books it's a little bit there's there's a barrier to entry because it's the written yeah. word you have to project your the way you read things or the way the way you understand that this person talks and sometimes if you're not careful Characters say the plot. Yeah. Right? They say yeah. the things that the author needs the, uh, the reader to, to either understand or like to move the plot along, right? But it's yeah. inconsistent to the way the character would be as you set them up for X amount of p p issues previous, right? Totally. So yeah. the, the, the things for me, it's like a bunch of little puzzles, right? To what am I trying to do with this page? Who gets to best deliver this bit of dialogue? Or... Um, how would this character react in this scene, right? And yeah. somehow that moves the plot along very, very nicely. And those discoveries keep me going. And then the drawing part, obviously, it's, you know, that's, that's the added bonus is I get to draw it as well. But that's the kind of stuff that that is, especially with this arc of Phoenix, I like to call it my, like, my, ex my five issue experiment. Yeah. And it's like, it's me figuring that out or me getting comfortable and like, oh, that would, they'd never say that. Right. I know yeah. I need that to be said, but that's not the character to say it. And if I have this character say it, right, then it's uncharacteristic of them to say. So I need mm -hmm. to find a better way to get that point across with the ideal person who needs to be talking right now. And what, like that's profound to me. That's so much learning about another side of storytelling. You yeah. Know? Big time, man. It's yeah. um it, it is so much like acting, I think, when it comes to writing characters. And uh, you, you have to treat them as, as their own individual entities. You have to really sure. get into their shoes, I think. And, For sure, yeah. And it's almost like you forget about who you are as the writer and you yeah. just think about who this character is. That's the best way to write a character, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, it's like yeah. method acting. I always For compare sure. it to method acting. For sure. There's there's plenty of books that I read in regards to like writing in a in a three act structure. And I, I remember this one thing that um one of the pieces of advice is like these guys who write out these ex exercises in which helps them understand their characters the best, right? Um uh, and I thought like, gosh, there's so much work that goes beyond, behind that. Like you have to understand mm -hmm. where they grew up. And like, well, again, it's just writing exercises so that you know that by the end of it, this is Tyler Durden. You know what I mean? Like yeah. all these things that leads into informing who Ty Tyler Durden is a character. That's great and everything. Totally. I, as I'm, what, what's refreshing and invigorating to me is somewhere a lot, as I'm writing characters, suddenly I get them. You know what I mean? I know that's kind of ass backwards from what I just said previously, which is understand your oh, character yeah. before you get in there. It's complex, but sometimes man. I write the character and then I get six or 10 pages in, right? And I go like, I get it. There's some that's obvious. I set it up. Mm. I was talking to um, Joe Fulton over the weekend, I think it was. And I, he was asking me, who is this character to you? Or we got into yeah. the, the, main, the main lead for 
uh, Arc Athena. And, it's, and I gave him a note. I said, uh, the, the lead for um, uh, Poseidon feels in the same texture as Rooster Cogburn from, from what do you call it, from, uh, from True Grit, as he's being performed by, not by John Wayne, but by um, Jeff Bridges, right? Mm -hmm. And immediately, Joe and I got it, right? Now we started talking about the character in the in the headspace of like I we know who that character is because that's how we would talk that's the cadence of delivery, but there were totally. some that I still needed to deconstruct and kind of like that's still ge the generic delivery of that dialogue you know and I'm having yeah. fun learning as I figure it out. Man, I think that's what is so. It's one of the most fun aspects about being a writer. I think is yeah. uh, sometimes you don't know what these characters yeah, are going to do and, sure. and they surprise you. Yeah. And and it is like watching a movie for the first time as you're writing that book. At, at least, you know, that is oftentimes the way it works for me is um, yeah. I'll, I'll realise, oh, this character isn't supposed to say that much dialogue. Like he's not supposed to talk as much. He's that strong for silent sure. type. For sure. um, or, you know, and, and the, the narrative itself kind of goes in directions that – I don't expect yeah. to, uh, yeah. which is which is a lot of fun, yeah. and so there is uh, something to be said for the the unseen muse that somewhat directs you, where yeah. uh, it, it's coming through you onto the page, and you're just yeah. the you're just the conduit essentially to to make it all happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, for which, sure. Yeah. It, and I never really believed in that stuff because I'm such a control freak, right? Like right. I love to plan everything out and yeah. make sure it's going to go exactly the way that I want it to go. Yeah. But then uh, writing comic books for the first time and the way I do it is I, I thumbnail everything out essentially. Okay. And okay. then and I'll, I'll even write out the dialogue on the thumbnail and then I'll, I'll type up the script after that. Yeah. And and for some, like a storyboard almost, yeah, and I sure. can take pages out, put pages in if I feel mm -hmm. that that's what's required. But uh, mm -hmm. just seeing the story come together in that way is is so cool, man. And and sometimes yeah. I'll think that there's got, I'll think I'll know what the next page is going to be, but then I'll realize actually this new page needs to go in between these two right. to make it flow a bit better. Right, right. I'm the same. I'm my process is similar, which is. I have a uh, a guide, basically a beat sheet, right? Yeah. And I ha I have what constitutes as the beginning, middle, and end for that issue. And in se in the series, I know how it's going to end, right? So yeah. it's it's general enough that there's plenty of wiggle room for creativity and surprises cool. in there. It's when I'm on, I'm on arc five now, and I set up so many edges of ribbons for the past four issues. And I told Joe this over the weekend. I'm like, I need to tie this into a, as pretty bow as I possibly mm. can. And I'm struggling. I'll tell you this. I, I'll, I'll candidly tell you, I'm struggling through issue five to write it. Oh, right, because it yeah. is the, it is when you really come to find out whether or not, at least for me, whether I can find out whether or not I'm capable of tying that pretty bow, right? Yeah. With a blank sheet of paper that didn't come. Like, for, I work in storyboards for animation since forever, right? And when you're yeah. reading a script, you kind of have an understanding of the writer's intent. You sit there and you go like, oh, okay, I know why these scenes are happening, but I'm still at liberty as this portion of the, the production process to kind of tighten those screws a bit, right? It may not have to be inside an elevator shaft. Maybe it could be right outside the elevator before they deliver this dialogue because by the time they get into the elevator shaft, a bunch of things need to happen instead. But yeah. that safety net is still predicated on the script that happened before me. Right. Mm -hmm. With arc, there's nothing. Right. I know yeah. guidelines wise where I need to go, and where I need to end up. I know the beats that need to happen to the characters so that their sacrifice, their motivations and all that kind of stuff line up. But it's in the way that they go and execute those things that make you go. That felt really cheap. I've done three drafts mm -hmm. of issue five so far. Yeah. At the end of issue four, I was so like, oh, this is so great. I have so much momentum. I'm just going to go right into issue five. Let me start jotting down the beats. And as I was doing it, mm. I was also coming up with a dialogue that they say, because this is act three, right? And so yeah. I'm like, how do I make this all make sense, right? right. It, are all of these things that these characters are saying still moving the plot along, but also true to them as I've set it up for four issues? And that, mm. that's not, and you're just, and I'm just worried about, 
you know, the back and forth, that that tennis game of conversation. I still have to yeah. pay attention to that through line of, you know, if the conversation of the matrix, let's say, still doesn't cover the high concept that is the matrix. You know what I mean? You still have no. to execute on the vision and the and the presentation of like bullet time and this cool ass action scenes and all these freaking, you know, the all the all True. the fight scenes and all that stuff, right? So that's independent of how to make dialogue work. Yeah, big time. It's I mean it's exposition, right? That's what yeah. that di dialogue does. That's what yeah. is revealed through characters. For sure. Um, and and you do have to use the kind of language that they would use. You have to make it so that they're understanding what is going on within the story in the way For that they sure. should understand it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, man, it's it's really really difficult to pull that off. But at the same time, it's the kind of challenge that gets you just so engaged. Oh yeah. Within yeah. what it is you're doing yeah. as a yeah. story writer. I was um I was talking to somebody offline about this and I just recently mm. read a comic and you know exposition is critical but it's in the way that you lay it out for people that doesn't make it seem like a wall of text. Oh yeah, you, you know can't like do yeah, when you're just explaining everything in like a two shot and like there's this two chunk bubbles with everything that like all this information is like the the directions to how to get from a point a to b there's something so mm. unnatural about that and it just goes to show like you know that's my fear is that i get into that space where i'm just giving you a wall of text so i can get it out of the way so we can get into the the cool shit you know so finding yeah. a way to give exposition that's beneficial to the plot true to the character but not so heavy handed that even the reader is going like, Oh my God, there's 50 bubbles on this page just so you can get the plot out of the way. You mm -hmm. know, that is totally. such a hard, like, that's like, you know, keeping a bunch of plates spinning all at the same time. You know? Yeah, it is, man. And, you know, not to complicate things or anything, but then you add to the fact that uh, exposition, it, it comes out in, in lots of different, uh, not necessarily 100 percent uh obvious ways so uh as an example i've got this scene in borok which is our, our spin-off of kozor right yeah and um basically this scene is just to serve the purpose of sh explaining who borok is yeah to an extent and who the yeah. other character is who we don't sure. know a lot about at this point sure sure um, but it's also to explain their dynamic. Yes. So Borok's dynamic with the the woman, the female character that he will continue the story with and establishing that. Sure, so sure. how do they interact with one another? How do they feel about each other? Well, that comes through in uh, the tone of which, in, in which things are said, not necessarily right. just the words themselves. It might be the right. lack of words even. Right. Right. right? Yeah. Um, it might be the way that uh, that the characters treat one another, and and I think that that's that's just so cool. It's it's almost like watching a comedy show, right? For it's sure. like you don't get the the full impact of the of the joke if it's not said in the right way necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I agree with you. Joe called yeah. me out on certain parts of issue one, and that he's going through it with a finer tooth comb now. Yeah, and he said. I get what you're going for, right? But you're talking through it so much, right? Because I'm a my one of the things that I'm afraid of is I'm trying to listen, I'm trying to understand that character's voice. And in my head, I know that's how their that's how their delivery is. But that's mm. when comics get away from you, right? Because you mm. get super wordy, you know? And the exactly. other thing that, that Joe called me out, I was like, you don't have enough panel space to put this wordy shit in it anyway, you know? <laughs> so I, I said, hey, man, I trust you to go and discover what the spirit is of what I'm trying to say and yet mm. still maintain the character voice that's happened, the, the character, the voice of the character that I'm trying to um, that I'm trying to put forward. Right. Because it's easy yeah. enough to edit something to the crux of like, you know, whether when it was 12 words, now it's maybe seven. Right. Saves mm -hmm. a ton of real estate when it comes to putting it on panels and on putting on pages, but if it loses character, it's detrimental to 
this it, it's detrimental to the point, right? So mm -hmm. you have to find that great balance between like, how can we do this? How can we do this with a level of conservation, but also have a better understanding of these characters? And it's really, really difficult. At least for me, it's difficult. So thank God Joe's in place, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It And it is difficult, man. I, I definitely agree with you. Uh, again, I, I, I like that it's a fun challenge though. Yeah. Uh, I, I really love that aspect of it. Yeah. And it's funny because it's not just the story as well. At least for us, it's it's also the art, you know, that can be tough. Yeah, um, you know, the showing is yeah. is just as uh much of a a brain teaser as the telling. And oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, it, it's a yeah. it's a funny thing, man. Comics Comic is, books it's no joke. Yeah, well, yeah. comics is everything is I think the, the 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 script has a tendency to highlight what you need to draw, but it is not the end point of what you need to draw, right? No. It says it's critical to understand what the intent, but then once you you actually still have to draw that, and sometimes you do more disservice to the script when you don't know how to draw something well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Big I get time. so caught up in drawing a um, I don't know something I rendered something to shit like an awful awful. Just I got caught up in the the exercise of rendering as opposed yeah. to understanding the intent of something. You're and talking to uh, you, so you speak my language. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then I'm like, I could have gotten away with drawing 50% less of this. Would have been so much more impactful emotionally and narratively. Um, but I just got caught up rendering leather. I just got caught. You know, I rendered vinyl. You know, and yeah. I'm like, I need to stop doing that. I need to pay attention to what's <laughs> most important. You know, man, I think about that all the time. And it's yeah. funny because, uh, you know, Kozor is definitely, which is our comic book for those yeah. Yeah, watching yeah, yeah. who don't realize, I'm sure you do. Uh, it's so detail and render heavy that, uh, you know, you, you almost have to make sure that all the panels that come there on after are somewhat just as detailed so that there's a consistency between the, the panels. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I find myself especially when it comes to female characters, just over-rendering them, putting yeah. in too much shadow, putting in Oof. too much articulation of the anatomy. Yeah. I'm telling you. And, and I've got to go back it, sometimes. That kills the drawing, man. Oh, that yeah, kills it. it does. Yeah. It ruins it. It ruins yeah. it, damn it. And I get caught up in, like, trying to make sure that the volume reads sometimes, you know? Like, hmm. I know what that thigh needs to look like. And it needs to look like all of the weight is just leaning on that thing as mm. they're stepping forward. And so I go and render it and I take a look at it. And like, I leave the table at nighttime or whatever it is when my drawing day is done. And I'm pretty proud of myself. You know what I mean? I'm kind of pulling yeah. up my pants and going like, yeah, I'm doing a good job today. This is fucking awesome. Well you know, I come back after I've gotten, you know, X amount of hours of sleep and I look at it and I go, why did we spend so much time on that stupid thing? We could have been into panel three or four by now. If we had just let sure. that thing alone, you know, communication, especially in comics, especially when you're trying to, um, especially when you're trying to get through something. And I don't know the speed and by which you move. So I, I may be talking about the my cadence, right? I have a tendency to like, I really want to get through it because yeah. I believe I get more, I get more out of the experience of publishing and getting it done than the experience of like noodling something. It's different for everybody, right? So I, I think I learn more by doing a ton, a ton of pages as opposed to doing three or four pages, you know? Are you ever concerned uh, that, you know, if you haven't given your all to these pages, and I'm sure mm. that, that you are, but, you know, you, you're not, you're being responsible about the time you spend on them by yeah, the sounds of it. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. But the, the irresponsibility that comes with spending way more time than you probably need to on a page mm. to increase mm. the impact. Yeah. Uh, do, do, are you ever concerned that maybe uh, you wouldn't have, you, you could have had more impact if you'd spent longer on those pages, that's if you'd spent an extra question. day or two even? No, that's a great question. I think I think I would then ask to, to that, I would ask you, I think you said something right now that's pretty critical, which is, mm. How do you define for yourself what your all is, mm. right? Because that's a slide. That's a slider for different people, right? Oh yeah. And so it's, it's like, is are is your all the amount of line mileage that you put per panel per page per 
X amount of, you know, mm-hmm. for, for the book, right? Or is it your landing, your landing story? My dog is going crazy. Hold on. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> uh, I gotta Sorry. love him. Yeah. So yeah, it goes back to what, you know, it goes back to that. Like, what does your mm-hmm. all mean? What does it mean for you to, you know, what I actually, what, it, what I guess what it comes down to is what are you prioritizing? Right? Yeah. If it, He's getting it's if it means going in there and being really detail heavy, right? And that's in line with your style, in line with the way you see your art, then great, right? But if hmm. it means you know you want to get in there and draw just at least for me, what's appropriate for me to, in order to communicate the information, then yeah. that's my all, you know, and that's where I get the most value, right? Totally, totally. It's it, it, that's a really interesting question, too. Um, because it is so true that uh, your all is it's different for everybody. Mm-hmm. And I remember saying to uh, my lovely partner just the other day, I said, you know what? One day I'm going to look back on Kozor and think, what the, what the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> like, is I right. insane? Yeah. Uh, and even now I will look back on some of my work and, and think the exact same thing. Like some of no, the... I like say it about your work when you show yeah, it off. Yeah, right? in our, in our, when you show it off, I'm like, that is that is a lot of pencil mileage, man. I don't oh, know how yeah. you have that much. How much you have that much uh, patience? <laughs> totally. It's not that's not diminishing the amount of work. I just no. look at it in contrast to my own, and I go like, that guy is so tenacious about getting these it's pages a, right. It's a different kind of like every every interior page is like the equivalent of a cover almost. For sure. Uh, for sure. But that's the value. That's the, that's the, that's the bar that you set for yourself though. Right. Totally. That's the challenge by mm. which you say, Hey, this, these sets of drawings in this, you know, uh, a portion of my life, these, this represents me and I want it to be represented in this manner. Totally. And so I never look at it and go like, Oh man, you know, you could have gotten away with so much less. And you know, I'm not in, I'm no, I'm no authority. I'm no authority to be in that space to be saying that out to anybody mm. because everybody gets to define that for themselves. You know, totally, man. Well, well, that's what my partner said to me as well. In response, she goes, "I think you do it uh, to prove to yourself that you can." That's so true. that would that would be my my measurement essentially. That's true. Of, of, oh yeah, of I mean, in my all. Yeah. yeah, in the spirit of that, that's the reason why I'm doing Athena, right? That's why I'm doing art because totally. I want to prove to myself that I can do it. My last failure in creator own space, independent of the stuff that I did with Malara, which is like the, the Chrononauts 2 book, the last creator own book that I ever did was a book called Run Love Kill for Image Comics. And oh, I did cool. not have the long term tenacity, right? I didn't quite understand how to take that book to a finish. So it went three or four issues at this point. It's so long ago, I can't even remember until I had to say, this is not, <clears throat> it became a question of finances and time time spent behind the table. And I yeah. couldn't manage it. It was just impossible for me. And that cloud wow. has always lingered over my head somehow to be like, anytime oh. I'm at a convention and somebody goes, hey, Eric, are you ever going to finish that thing? And I, I would shame. I go, I don't, I don't think so. It just doesn't make much sense for me. But somehow I needed to prove it to myself that I can do something start to finish. And this is that, to your point, I wanted to prove to myself that I could do it. I'm still doing it, right? But this sure. the part of this exercise is to prove that out. Yeah, that's great. So it's, yeah. uh, I mean, that is that is tough, man, to, to have uh, almost a, a sense of regret about a past oh, yeah. um, For sure. thing that you set out to do. For sure. And. <clears throat> It seems like you are going to certainly uh, more than conquer that that thing that's haunting you with Arc Athena. You just it, jinxed it. You literally just jinxed no, it. No, no, no. I can tell, man. Because so, how many issues have you got of Arc Athena already done? Um, drawn four. Drawn, yeah. Four. Right. See, that's amazing, man. Yeah, out of five, yeah. and I, I think I'm on a good track for a launch in September. Knock on wood, that's still on track, right? That's incredible, now, man. The great part, and I believe this is a genuine benefit, but also the nerve wracking part is again, I keep bringing up Joe Fulton coming in, you know, you know, as I'm laying down the track and the train is going down the path, right? At whatever hundreds of miles per hour, Joe is coming, you know, is, is right behind that train and going like, you might want to come back and touch this thing up because nobody, you know, it's like, 
you need to show up X amount of miles behind you. Yeah. Because it only makes sense. That's the, the benefit of an editor because they get to look at it with an unbiased eye and try to, and, and more importantly, they're there in the support capacity. They're trying to help you sell the thing that you are trying to do on your own, right? And so my fear, four issues in, jumping into writing five, right? I, He's going to, how did I phrase it to him this past week? And I'm like, I'm not gonna write five until you and I are aligned that issues one through four is good, yeah, right? Because there may be something there in that something that I miss in the, the, the in my periphery that I was not paying attention to that is so critical that not having that information on hand by the time we get into five, it just makes you go like, oh, that's amateur hour. You know what I mean? Like, why didn't why didn't you figure that out? Why couldn't you see that? Right. And so totally. that's why I had to pause and really think about issue five, right? With everything that Joe and I spent two hours maybe just talking about. And generally the arc of where these characters are going to go, it's a team book. So that was one of the big challenges was like, I can't believe the first thing that I'm doing on my own writing and drawing, I'm going to focus on 10 characters, you know? Mm -hmm. So that I needed to negotiate that with myself. So finally I talked to him about like what this book is all about and who ultimately the primary characters that you're paying attention to everybody's everybody else is playing a, um, a supplementary role. Right. And gotcha. then I asked him, keep me honest with these two characters, cool. right? So cool. if he picks something out that's like, eh, that's, that's weird. And he did a handful of times, right? Or he's like, absolutely. Um, yeah. That's my fear is that I'm not honest. I'm not delivering on the promise of the series, which is a character based mm. story that just happens to be wrapped around like an alien invasion. So, right. Like, Wait. That's my, that's why I had to pause and really slow down five and understand the sort of corners I've accidentally or purposely paint, painted myself into. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. See, sometimes I think uh, corners and painting yourself into them uh, can be an interesting storytelling me mechanism in and of oh, itself. Yeah. yeah. Then you get to write more story, which. <laughs> <laughs> It yeah. serves the purpose to get you out of those corners, uh, yeah. at least, you know, in some situations. Sometimes it's just a big mistake, a big hiccup that you've got to Absolutely. address. Absolutely. There's there's instances in the, and talking about writing your, myself into a corner because I am such a, I'm so afraid that if I don't explain something, it may not land as well, right? Mm -hmm. So I have the great benefit of having a very creative herself a very creative and very intuitively smart writer and creator in my wife who's a who's an artist and a painter and all that kind of stuff so i run ideas by her all the time and there's plenty of times when i'm trying to exp i'm trying to give her the the summary of the thing that i'm that's blocking me and i go through the paces of explaining this character says this and this character does that and she goes like you don't need to get you don't need to say that part yeah. It's so not that just brings everything through a screeching halt of the emotional momentum, the actual physical momentum of the story that you're trying to like. But if I don't totally. say that, doesn't that mean I'm not do, be doing my diligence in explaining that character? And, and mm -hmm. she's like, yes, but it's more detrimental to forward progress. You yeah. know what I mean? It's all of these, you balance things out. You go like, okay, that may come off as lazy, but if I do that now, it just makes things so much choppier than they need to be. Totally. So this one thing that I was struggling with, as soon as I said, okay, I'm gonna just, I'm working with two scripts in front of me right now, man. And one script is the the just the, the mental vomit that I'm like, okay, I need these yeah. things to happen. The other one is the fleshed out one where I just copy and paste. And as soon as I started yeah. doing that, right? Like, okay, I don't need that. I'm just gonna leave that, but I do need this copy paste. And I yeah. read it and I'm like, oh my gosh, look how much lighter that is. You yeah, know, and so, so much smarter, uh, those scenes just cut together so much better, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, that's, that's all writing is, is editing, right? Like, yeah. I mean, you, you need that genuine vomit of expression yeah. to, to have something to work with. That's, that's sure. your clay. That's your putty essentially. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And um, absolutely. yeah, I think that it's a little bit more difficult for you because you are doing a team up book that has mm -hmm. characters within it that you yeah. have to explain 
each one needs to be unique and compelling in and of themselves and to not do that in a generic way yeah. when you're you're working with the alien invasions and um, i'm guessing soldiers or superheroes or something like that yeah yeah um that can be really really tough man to, to make those characters feel real to make them feel believable and as though they're they're actual individuals you're, you're giving me way too much credit i think i'm good i'm just right at the groove of generic i'm right yeah. there i don't mind generic just yeah. as long as it's competent generic you know like, well, generic can be good man i, I yeah, think man. one thing that i've realized about all of my favorite movies is and all of my favorite uh comic books even yeah. is that they have very simple ideas sure very simple dialogues and Super very simple yeah. characters yes right? yeah yeah and, yeah you think about a movie like let's just take uh Let's take The Predator, for example. I don't know if yep. you've seen that movie before. I'm sure yeah. you have. Yeah. Love um, that movie. Love that simple, movie. Such a simple concept. Mm -hmm. But it's so cool. And the one-liners yes. are cheesy, but we love them because of that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You could so yeah. easily overcomplicate something like that by going into the lore of The Predator or right. over-explaining why the Marines are there in the first place and whatnot. Right. But right. Here's the thing, and I, and I want to help underline this because I think I've breezed by it very, very quickly. Mm. I don't have an issue with generic, right? Yeah, totally. I have an issue when it's generic and you can't even, even do it well, right? Yeah. Because like generic, generic already boring. Set, exactly, generic boring, generic like, you know, too, too wordy, too explainy. You lose track of the, you lose track of the narrative. You took, you lose track of the character. Generic gives you, to me, what all generic means is it gives you handrails. It gives you, you know, like these, these guidelines, right? Mm -hmm. Stay within this parameter. And I think you're going to be pretty good. I've seen plenty and read plenty of generic comic books where I'm like, you're trying to subvert expectation too much. You landed this six pages ago. But you yeah. tried to do something fancy that you didn't need to, and it really yeah. did. Is a, it's detrimental to the overall momentum and the the idea behind what you're trying to say, you know? And I think it's yeah, there's sure. this weird thing that people are just trying to do something that is so profound and so different when the when the meal is already there. You don't need to yeah. add to, you don't need to add the ten extra ingredients. You already had it, you know. You don't need to work that hard at it, you know. I and I'm I'm just as I'm guilty of that, right? Yeah, like, it's, wouldn't it be cool if there's like a, a cool robot? You know, and I'm like, no, yeah. don't, don't put the robot. You know? Like it's it's hard not to overcomplicate things. I think that's one of our greatest challenges as as artists. It starts out as a great idea, very simple idea, and then that thing just it freaking grows into a monster sometimes. For sure, For sure man. Um, there's times when I write, and also I don't know if you've experienced this before, and especially in. Hmm. Uh, maybe if, if we have time, if you have time for it, I'll go through a couple of pages of issue four with you. And yeah. on this on the script or on the beat sheet, I'm like, and then, you know, the the what do you call it? The the bad guy Imperial Guard dive into the entire fleet of mechanized drones. That's easily that's just sub sub twenty words, right? Yeah. But now I have to go draw that shit. Yeah. Right. And I, oh. and I was thinking like, as, as soon as I wrote it, I knew that it was critical. I knew that it was important. Right. Can you imagine the commute, the communication that you're doing subtextually to your reader when there's a cool slew, like a, a sky full of, you know, mechanized Iron Man drones. Mm. Right. And yeah. three bad guys are going up against them. Right. The subtext of that is like, holy crap, these three guys against an army full of, you know, those Iron Men from Iron Man 2. Yeah. You know I mean, those the yeah, big yeah. badass guys with guns on their shoulders. That's I knew sick. the importance of that, but I still had to sit there and come to terms with like, I had to freaking draw that, man. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah, worth but it's, it, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because yeah. it all pays, it all is in tribute and in service to the narrative and the story. Mm. So the guys who skip it, I'm kind of like, you're you're doing a disservice to that, you know? Totally. Yeah, it's funny with the whole overcomplicating aspects of the story. I've always viewed that as somewhat of a, a pacing tool. So mm -hmm. if you, the, the more panels you add into a scene, mm -hmm. the more drawn out that scene will feel, the more of a, a slower pace it'll have. The more yeah. pan panels you cut out of it, 
yeah. the faster it's going to speed it up. And you know what? It's strange that you say that because I'd never, that never clicked with me in that manner. I know yeah. the theory, right? But in yeah. regards to me actually doing it, I don't know if I, if I've done it enough in application to understand its impact, right? Mm -hmm. But I've seen, and you're, you're probably the, the, you know, one of the few people that I talk to in regards to like pacing and panel layout, right? Mm. And so when I hear that, I go like, that's so strange because I've never experienced that before. I've never looked through the dark night and seen, mm. you know, the 10 panel, you know, 12 panel layout and go, oh, this yeah. feels really, really slow. But I know there's a reason for it. And when you say it, I'm like, right, right. That doesn't make sense, you know? Totally. So when you're it's, reading it, you don't feel like it's slower? No, what slows me down is shitloads of text right yeah it's like yeah it that blobs does. and blobs and blobs of text if it's three panels and there's blobs of text that is like yeah. oh my god it's like going through slow traffic you know but with well, panels that are like 12 right and the mm -hmm. text is evenly distributed through them the only thing i'm really looking for is the person who's saying it or people who are talking and going like oh this must be a, a vigorous conversation and i get through it pretty quickly you know yeah for sure yeah. All right, let's take a look at what uh, the the chat's saying. There's a, there's a yeah. few questions here for you, I think, as well. Um, all right. Oh, hey, hey, Monstrosity Sex. It's good to have you here. We've got Lord Crackhead, uh, lots of wonderful people, and uh, Albino Thunderbuns, I believe that's Joe. Mm -hmm. he's, he's in the house. He's, uh, yeah, that's um, my, cool. my life so, raft. <laughs> hell yeah. Uh, so... Akira Ho Frank Herv says, Hi, Eric. Uh, what would you recommend on visual storytelling and how do you study Loomis? It, it tried, I tried to read creative illustration, but when I arrived on tone or color, I just got confused and lost. What would I study? There's a few questions in that one question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll try to answer them. I'll try to answer them as, as clearly as I can. I rarely go through visual storytelling and learn through comics because I think that's there's too much derivative going on there. And then ultimately, it's borderline incestual. Forget the term, right? Because like there's people who do shots in comics that you know that's their shot. So when you do it, people look at it and go like... That's so-and-so shot, that's so-and-so angle, that's so-and-so's composition, right? Mm -hmm. so I love looking at movies and deconstructing movies for why that those those scenes, those shots, whatever the intent is of that shot, makes the most sense. So if you take a look at my work and go, it's a big compliment to me when you look at my work and go like, that's that shot from Casablanca. I'm like, yes, yeah. absolutely, because that's where I freaking stole it from, you know? Hell like, yeah. Or that's a shot from, you know, that's a shot from Seven in the Dave Fincher movie. I'm like, yeah, absolutely, because uh, I stole it from Dave Fincher. You know what movie. I mean? Like, but when I, but when people go like, oh, that kind of reminded me from this thing from Dark Knight, I genuinely shrug because I go, I don't remember take, I don't remember Dark Knight at all. You know, I don't remember Jim Lee shots. I remember Jim Lee drawings. I don't remember his compositions. I don't remember his page layouts. But so, so if I could suggest something to you, it's like really going to through story, like learning through storytelling through me, I learned through moving pictures, right? I yeah. learned how to stage a gunfight watching heat, right? Which is a Michael Mann. Awesome. Like I know how to set up a, oh, these guys are being barricaded and these guys are being pinched in the middle of the street by watching it. And I've used it a bunch of times, right? In, in storyboarding for animation, right? Hmm. Um, as far as um, the, the, the Loomis stuff, I don't know, I've not, I've not gone through those books. But one thing you really have, you could do yourself a huge favor is by understanding and really coming to terms with what those words mean, right? You use like tone or color, right? And it's, for me, it took me forever to understand certain definitions so that we're all talking the same language. Does that make sense? Because sometimes people kind of, you know, substitute words that mean that they think mean the same thing. And oftentimes it doesn't, it's just kind of like flip flopping on words. So the thing that I had to wrap my mind around was saturation. Um, uh, what do you call it? Oh crap. Uh, saturation, a, um, what is it when you, I'm trying to make an, a point, but it, it's, it's yeah. skipping. It's leaving uh -huh. my brain. Yep, hue, value, saturation. Hue, value, saturation. Yep. That's it. Wrap your mind around and really understand what those mean. Yeah. 
and you can have a decent conversation with people about yeah. what their intent is or what their feedback is, you know? Yeah, and by the way, those those key elements I have uh, come to discover are absolutely necessary for breaking up a page and making it readable. Uh, yeah. They're the tools you've got at your disposal. And sure. if you don't use them effectively, it can really flatten your page, make all of the, the key focal points kind of merge into one. Yeah. Uh, sure. unreadable mess so yeah definitely use co the contrast of those elements hue yeah. saturation and value to make a, a readable composition i hope that was helpful man yeah abso absolutely man that, that stuff is great i think that watching movies a lot can often make uh your intuition as a comic book artist much greater mm. Um, mm. because i think i think that i'm sorry go ahead dude. Well, I was just wondering, Eric, does when you're doing up a page for a comic book, what are you imagining in your mind? Are you imagining it playing? Are you imagining it playing it out? Like, is it mm. is it a, like a watching a movie unfold inside your imagination? No, no. And I was going to add to what you said, which is like, mm. you know, you were saying how movies have a tendency to sort of train an intuitiveness into an artist's mind, right? And ultimately, yeah. like, <clears throat> it helps inform their shot, shot selection and blah blah. For me, how I analyze a movie is whenever I'm watching a scene, I take a look at what is happening, right? Like, mm -hmm. what is the story? Joe goes from this end of the room to this end of the room, but unfortunately, he's undecided on whether or not when he gets to the end of that room, he's going to tell his wife she's about to leave him or he's about to leave her. Yeah. Right. That's the point of that scene, right? That's the story, right? The, comp yeah. the shot selection helps to elevate that narrative yeah right you could do a very boring straight on like here's a profile shot and he moves from room a to room b <clears throat> but unfortunately it doesn't do anything to help stand up and elevate the narrative the story yeah. so what i'm paying attention to is oh right you know i just i was just watching pacific rim earlier today yeah Big, okay cool what did you think of it disgusting like fight scenes and i'm like that is the that is so bombastically loud and amazing and fun right but cool. then you take a look at why those shots were happening on scene and you're like because they're the clearest there's mm. these huge robots completely scaled up to the nth degree kaiju that have like weird head shapes and it's really hard to understand where anything is on them because they're not beetles they're not pigs they're not chickens it's hard to understand what these shapes are so hmm. Del Toro picked a shot that helps you understand any time that a kaiju comes into scene, he'll go to a shot that's the clearest identifying thing about that kaiju, Yeah. right? He gives you handles to understand what that form is. And so when the when when Gypsy Danger comes into scene and they start fighting, you're like, I'm never lost as to what he's punching, if he's mm -hmm. punching the stomach, if he's punching the head, if he's punching whatever the heck it is, right? It's very clear. And that's a that's a regular fight scene. It becomes that much more in, in, involved when you're doing a narrative scene, but a talking scene between two people. What's the subtext yeah. about that talking scene? You know, it's easy enough to just, again, pick a side shot, you know? Like, this is what this means. Uh, or excuse me, this is what they're saying, and let's just get through the dialogue. But I think next level stuff is like, what are they talking about? How does it impact one character or the other? And you position them and compose them in such a way that really mm. helps elevate that narrative. That's what I'm looking yeah. at. That's what I'm looking at in movies. Oh, totally, for sure, man. I I certainly come at it from that perspective as well. I think I add to it, though. Once I've got that shot down, I think about, okay, how would that fit into a like a sequence if it was a movie oh, sure. or, or an sure. anime or something like yeah, that? Yeah, that's super helpful. It's almost like I can't help to imagine it that way because I'm such a a big fan of movies. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I see them as this this window into another reality, another world. Sure. And and that certainly can be said for comic books too. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so in a sense, I'm hoping to achieve that experience for my readers when they partake in a comic book. So that when they're as they're reading it, it's almost as, as if it, it unfolds like a movie for them. Like mm, they, mm. they can see from one panel to the next the the transition but between the two, not just the panels themselves, but that actual transition as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. That's awesome. I think that's again, there's so much that goes into this. It's it's no wonder we become passionate about it. There's there's endless 
facets that we can think about yes, and yes. that we can tuck have, into and that we can analyze. But I have friends that just like shrug it off and be like, I just draw the cool ass thing, you know, like. I know. And well, I, that's I, I don't know if I'm, with, if I'm, what do you call it? And I'm so much yeah. more jealous of those guys that just like click off there and they're just amazing draftsmen. We're like, that's a great okay. shot. What were you thinking when you did that shot? And you're like, nothing I just wanted to do. Be, yeah, be different. Like I hear people do this all the time and I don't know if you, <clears throat> because in comics it allows for it. Like in a five panel sequence, those shots should be like, oh, here's a wider shot and now here's a close up, and now here's like a, a medium. And then now, you know what I mean? They're like switching up the shot selection. Mm -hmm. And I understand the intent behind that. Don't make the scene almost samey samey, right? Yeah. But it feels like they're just doing it because of that one rule. Don't make all the shots the same kind of angle, the same kind of perspective and switch yeah. it up a little bit. But if I were to ask them, like, why did you do that? If yeah. the only thing that you say is, oh, because I didn't want to have the same shot over and over again, I go like, I guess there's value to that. But there's really yeah. no motivation behind it beyond that, you know? So to me, yeah. that's where I kind of get lost in. Like, I want the shots to be purposeful, motivated, and then tell a story, right? Mm. Well, that goes back to what we were talking about before, where it's like, what kind, what do you want the reader to feel exactly. when they are witnessing one of these oh, exactly. panels? Yeah. And that sometimes can determine the shot. Yeah. And one thing I've been realizing and, and picking up as I read through the massive volumes of Berserk that I've uh, just purchased for myself is that. Oh, right on. Yeah, yeah, man. It's 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 really so amazing. Just the the stuff we were talking about earlier with the the pacing of story and what you show mm, and what you don't mm. show. This guy was a master at yes. achieving it okay. in, in a very in in very few frames. But sometimes you'd have scenes that that would only take a few frames that he would actually draw out into yeah. multiple pages. Yeah, and it's like it, and it works really really well. But uh, when, as I said, one thing I've been realizing is those those straight on side shots or those straight on front views, even though it's it's almost discouraged when you learn about the craft of creating comics because you know everything should be dynamic. Mm -hmm. It can be so impactful when you oh, put yeah. them in the right place. Oh yeah, yeah. If yeah. you pace it correctly, and then the next thing you know, you're just looking at your you know um, you know your protagonist or antagonist straight on. It's yeah. volumes, man. It's freaking scary sometimes how effective that, that is. is, you know? Yeah, it's intimidating. It's, it yeah. freaks you out a bit. Um, but, yeah, as I said, I love thinking about this stuff. I was dreaming about making comic books just the other night. You, know? you were? <laughs> yeah. And I, I actually like that. You know, I Did like you really? Thinking, yeah, dude. I was, my, I was. My worst anxiety dreams are when I'm thinking about comic books, especially yeah. when it comes to this, because it's like, it, 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 it's so pervasive, it gets into my subconscious and then into my dreaming state where I'm like, I can't not think of, I, I gotta not think about this right now or else it's yeah. just gonna be my entire day, you know? Totally. I try to find ways to establish a decent work-life balance and if all I'm thinking about is comic books all the time, I'm like, I'm doing something wrong. I'm not clearing yeah. the cache once in a while, you know? I should probably do that one. I, I should probably do that myself just to, yeah. you know, stay sane and, be present for my family Dude. and my friends. <laughs> it's, I think it's one of the most critical things for, it may not mm. seem like it now, but I've been doing this for a while. And I remember what, I know what burnout feels like. Oh, and, yeah. I'm, and I'm pretty proud to say that I have not experienced the worst version of it in recent times. I can definitely feel when I'm, in, I'm right at the door of it, where I'm kind of like, okay. whoa, this is no longer creative. This is a job. And I hate Just that. Describe, like, describe some of the, the finer points of, of that so that if, if people are approaching burnout, and I'm, yeah. I'm asking this for my own curiosity <clears throat> as much as anyone else's, yeah. uh, what, what they should look out for. It's not going to be identical for everybody. So far be it for me to say, hey, it's going to be exactly like this. But for me, it goes like this. Like this thing that I used to love or this thing that I love. I love drawing these pages. I love doing, doing the, the compositions and, you know, from pencils to inks, the whole process of like, oh, I know how to draw this better. And I pour myself into it. There were mm -hmm. times during this pr process, because this isn't a sprint, this is a marathon, right? Where it really did feel tedious where I'm sitting here looking at these panels and I go like this now, this is no longer enjoyable as it once was, because that's my point of reference. When okay. I was like really feeling the joy of drawing this book, right? Yeah. But then there were a couple mornings there and <clears throat> it may have been something I ate previously or just my, just my overall state of mind. 
right? I walk yeah. into the studio and I go like, I'm not having fun drawing this page. That should be fun. Cause I'm looking at the elements in it. I'm like, this is in my wheelhouse. This is the kind of stuff that makes right. me salivate to get at. But right now I do not feel like drawing it. And that's when I step away. And there's, there's a couple here that I just drew through, right? You know, I just kind of muscled mm -hmm. through and I yeah. look at the page now and I'm like, oh, I was definitely trying to cross that off. I was just trying to check that box and say, right. I'm moving on. I actually went back and just touched it up a bit, you know, just cool. so I can, cool. I can have the feeling of, of completion without just saying I did it for the sake of doing it. But that's what yeah. it feels like for me, right? Where I'm like, that yep. should be exciting to draw. Those are the things that I really, really love drawing. I know what I can picture it in my head, what this should look like, but I'm just not into it. Now mm -hmm. the ultimate burnout for me is when I can picture nothing, which is means like I have a level of apathy towards this entire endeavor where I'd rather, wh whether or not I do this doesn't matter to me. That's when oh. I knew like, oh, I need to get out of here. You know, like yeah. I need to go do something else for a while, rethink what my strategy is around this, or just not be in this, uh, be in this headspace. Because that that one, man, there's so difficult to recharge your batteries out once you're in that space. Yeah, it is difficult, probably because of the uh, the negative association you create. The longer you're in that burnout mode for, for sure, the the longer you're going to remember how that feels working okay. on that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, have you experienced I, I can, it before? Are you have you gone through anything um, that dramatic or anything that drastic? I certainly have come to the belief that I need breaks after a big undertaking. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I just I just finished off uh, a, a big page for Kozor. Yeah. Uh, that took a, a fair bit out of me. <clears throat> yeah. And so I spent a few days setting up my studio, which is you know like it's looking all good. Yeah. But, um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I, I definitely needed that just because yeah. Otherwise, it can, it can really uh, fatigue you. I think for sure. Absolutely. And it, it's it's weird to say those things because you know physically, if you want to run a big marathon, you can see mm -hmm. okay, that person is fatigued. Yeah. But that mental fatigue can be, you know, sometimes you think, oh man, maybe I can just maybe it's a figment of my imagination and I can yeah. overcome it if I'm just more determined. Yeah. But yeah, it yeah, rarely. Yeah. It really is a figment of your imagination. It's weird what the, it's just, a, I think what happens with people when it comes out of nowhere for them is they don't have enough personal mindfulness of how they conduct themselves as a human, you know? Like if they internalize and are aware of who they are as people, and as soon as that burnout flag kicks on, you have to do something about that because to just muscle it through, it has more long-term, like I almost want physical burnout more than I want emotional and, and mental one because at least physical one, I know how to treat it and I know approximately how long it'll take, right? Yeah. But mental to come back from that, oh man, it's it's un yeah. a knowable number and it's so, it's it's it can be pretty, it can be, you know, it can destroy your momentum if you're not careful. It can, man, for sure. I think I definitely experienced that with some of the how to draw comic stuff back in the yeah. day. Yeah, because yeah, I would spend like six months on a single course. Sometimes I'd spend a year on a single course. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and that would involve like day, like weeks, months of just script writing for the yes. superhero wins course. That was five hours of script essentially. Ooh. So yeah, that was really really hardcore. And yeah. uh, I remember after that, I wanted to do superheroes. And I tell you what, that never happened because yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I was just, I was just completely, me yeah, mentally wrecked after that. Yeah, yeah. And I see how that kind of, that feeling that can, you you know a mm. smile crawled across your face right now when you were mentioning the superhero course, right? That Super, feeling yeah. still lingers. It right? does, yeah. You're like, yeah. well, I'm still burned. I still remember the feeling that I would, the emotional state that I was mm. in, the psychological state that I was in when I felt that. And as soon as you mentioned the next course that you said you didn't get to, you had a look on your face where you're like, that wasn't going to happen. You know, like yeah. it's such a tell that you're like, yeah, you're yeah. still experiencing a version of that burnout from back in the day. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. So you're, you're a really smart guy, right? Because, yeah. uh, <laughs> Yeah, because I, I I learned about I learned about that stuff as well. Um, getting into the whole marketing thing and and the psychology thing, I remember back in the day you could uh, you could make someone feel happier just by bringing them back to a 
a more fond memory of something and, and you can sure. tell whether or not that had worked by the smile that they'd get on their face yeah yeah um yeah, I, yeah. I love that stuff and, and just the fact you picked it up i'm like yeah eric eric switched on eric's a good it's, what you, it's, it's a lot of you know you and i were talking about earlier about you mm. know being mindful of how people uh, you know how you pose your characters because it communicates so much for right? sure um, in when you're drawing comics, and I think this what this gets lost in animation. When I was when you're watching good animation by a by an animation studio, and I'm not just talking about like the the Pixar's and Disney's, but a good animation studio that know what they're doing in regards to how to make people emote. They know how to capture that thing that best communicates in the not necessarily it's not even subtle, right? But they know mm -hmm. how to plus one plus ten that thing that makes you go like, oh, that person is cued into something. Yeah, right. They kind of, I call it like projecting to the eighth row if you're performing a stage performance, right? Like they're yeah. really plussing up that, that number. And that's what I get caught up with when I'm watching people, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I know how that guy with those particular set of features would communicate X. Mm -hmm. you, you know totally. what I mean? Like, you know, yeah. somebody who's, who's um, 300 pounds when I'm drawing it in a stylistic way, communicates fatigue very differently and very uniquely than oh, yeah. somebody who's a hundred pounds communicating fatigue when yeah. I draw them. Right. For sure. For sure. So I think th those, those are very nuanced. And that's why I'm like, when I'm paying attention to what's happening when you said, Oh yeah, I couldn't mm -hmm. even finish that thing. I was like, Oh yeah, that's just yeah. me paying attention. You know? Well, man, that's so important because again, it's, we're talking visual communication here, right? Yes. And, yeah, and it is absolutely. those subtle cues, and and <clears throat> most, I would I would almost bet that most comic book artists don't take full advantage of that, as as you've said, mm. um, they don't incorporate those subtleties, and they can be very very subtle into their characters' facial expressions and their, mm. their body language. Yep. And as the reader relates with a character, remember that wherever those characters are at emotionally, you're taking the reader to those places as well. For sure. It's an it's important. It's yeah, important big that time. you do. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's not enough that you're sitting there reading the reading the dialogue or the di mm. dialogue but bubble. I mean, maybe it is, you know, maybe people can read between the lines, but if I can do my job as a visual storyteller to help uphold, if not plus one plus mm. then the narrative by drawing them in the right pose, right? For sure. That's my job, you know? Heck yeah. Yeah. It's so funny because uh, even just the other uh, – the last night as I was reading Berserk, uh, again, I, I said to my partner – she never wants to hear about this stuff, but I say it to her anyway. I go, honey, this guts guy. This, this guy's <laughs> me. This right. guy is me. Like, right, right. check out this dialogue, and I'll write out some dialogue. She's like, that's not you. But at the time, I feel like it's me yeah. as I'm reading it. And yeah. That's awesome, man. That's that's what you you want your readers to have that reaction to yeah. your book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There is a I pick up mannerisms all the time, and I try to inject them into the characters that I draw. Mm -hmm. There's a character in uh, in Athena that is Jude Law from mm -hmm. a very particular movie that he's in. You know? Oh yeah. What, what's he, it called? It, it's a it's a it's called The Holiday. Have you seen that before? It's a romantic uh, no, comedy. I it's a romantic comedy and he plays opposite. I can't remember who the actor, I think it's Kenry Diaz, but it's the way that he conducts himself in that movie uh, that I tried to inject into one of the characters uh, from the from the corporate side of the the R corporation, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. It's Jude Law mixed with the, the voice of the, gosh, there's a weird reference pull, but there's a character in um, Casino Royale. At the end, there was a banker at the end of Casino Royale in which he's yeah. asking, uh, James Bond's character to input the 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 pin code yeah. for the for for the deposit of their money. That character, that banker, is the voice that I told Joe Fulton. Imagine that guy talking these lines, and Joe goes, "Right, I see it." That's awesome. Yeah, that's a good tactic to use as well. Is if you can imagine your characters as having the same sort of or at least a familiar personality yeah. to somebody uh, that already exists, you know, in a movie, right. already yeah. established character, because at least then you can, as the writer, somewhat imagine that. And, yeah. and you've got the choice to pick who, who, which character you base it on. So it's still 
quite so, unique in the way it's that- not, it doesn't have to be a one-to-one analog just because i'm thinking no. of jude law doesn't mean i'm drawing jude law i'm just like imagining the uh, the, the mannerisms behind that character you know what i mean exactly. or the voice and the delivery of that character you know yeah, for sure. So let's let's talk about Argathena a little bit because, yeah. man, this is uh, one point of admiration for you that I, I greatly have because uh, you've just managed to knock out four issues in a very small amount of time uh, as far mm-hmm. as the drawing side of it is concerned. Mm-hmm. And uh, what would you say? Is that within a year? I feel like it, ha- it can't have been more than that. I could have sworn that the very first time that I had said anything Arcathena related was on your show, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It, right? it, it might have been. It might I have been. I think it was. And it's so funny that we're having this conversation now as I'm sort of driving down the road to what looks like home. Hopefully mm-hmm. it's not burnt to the ground. But certainly it's it's kind of complimentary to think that you were the, your, you and your audience were the first ones that kind of dug into it with me. And now here we are having conversations about like, oh, how far along are you on? And you're nearing the end already. So it's a weird oh. journey and I've totally lost track of time when that yeah. was to where, when, when we, where we are now. You know, yeah. it's just, it's been so much fun and it's been such a great learning experience for me um, that it really feels like you and I just had that. I remember you said, hey, Eric, would you, would you mind coming on to the show and, and talking about Arcathena? And that's mm. the first time that I'd ever shown a panel from it. Because mm. I think anything that I'd ever done was just either roughs or like maybe a headshot somewhere or like some weird, you know, unfinished design. And I said, actually, the colorist just turned in a couple of pages for his tryout to make sure, and this is Giuliano. So Giuliano just turned in and nailed what the color palette or the approach was going yeah. to be. Would you mind if I shared it while we're streaming? And you did. And I think that kind of set up this sort of like, okay, the people are reacting to it positively. So I must be on to something. And from it just catapulted from there. So that's my roundabout way of saying thank you for that. I appreciate it. Oh, that. man. No. All good. The pleasure yeah. is is ours for sure. Uh, do you want to show uh, one of the, the latest pages? Yeah. Yeah, well, I can show you that the most recent page that I've finished in drawing, but not in dialogue, is issue four. And I'll show you the, the perfect example. Mm-hmm. It goes back to what we were talking about five minutes ago. Awesome. If I, can, if, I can, if I can press the right button and not completely dox myself. <laughs> no, oh, we, we don't want to. Do. How is it? Uh, share. Okay. Share yeah. screen. And I'm going to find a window, and it should be this one. Yeah, so great. You can see that. Awesome. Okay. okay. Yeah, I can see that. There okay. We go. So here's here's the panel in which I drew first of all of those mechs pouring out of, you know, this gi- these three giant, um, uh, these three giant um, battle carriers, right? These airborne battle carriers. Mm, that's so, so cool. So here's what it looks like just with them out of the scene. And this is what it looks like when I started drawing them on a completely different la- layer, right? Mm -hmm. And so I showed this to my friends and they were like, that's great. That's awesome. These guys are like, like, oh my gosh, like that page. But then somebody said, wouldn't it make more sense because these guys are military. These guys are like trained pilots and what have you. Wouldn't it make sense to fly as a column similar to the way jet planes would? Mm -hmm. And I thought like, Oh, you piece of shit. You're absolutely right. And I don't want to redraw that. Page. I hate it when people are right. I hate it. I absolutely can't stand it. But I didn't want to immediately throw that, you know, um, feedback out the window because there's legitimacy behind it, right? Yeah. What does sure. it mean? So I actually did it again, right? Thankfully, I, wow. I did it as a as an overlay. But here's the thing, and we were talking about it earlier. What the reality that they were introducing into the concept, which is they could probably be flying in column. In a call, and that makes a lot of sense because again, military did not capture the emotion. Mm. So after I drew it, I took a look at it and I said, like, that doesn't work. Because it's missing that raw emotion of them pouring out of the pouring out of the battleships or the flying aircraft carrier. So I was like, my gut was right, but I had to proof it out. 
by yeah. by doing this page. Does that make sense? So that's what you and I were talking about that like 10 minutes ago, which is like, yeah, totally. sure, that might be reality, but we have to escalate that level of reality to land a version of the narrative that really does have that best form of impact. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure, for sure. So that's so true. You know, re and reality isn't always good to uh, base your comic book page off or, or what's happening sure. in your comic book. Um, because it can be boring. You know, reality is reality and we live it every day. But a comic book is kind of our our vehicle for escape into a much larger, greater, and more compelling version of the, the life we lead. I agree. And here's something that, that I mean, I don't know if this is, is too much politic for this conversation. So forgive me. If okay, it is. Go ahead. I think there's been emphasis in recent superhero comics to introduce a version of reality that's not attractive to a to an audience that's looking for something that is not that right yeah. and what i mean by that is like i don't like it when people when comics especially superhero comics humanize people too much humanize heroes too much put mm. them in like regular people proportions totally right? yeah. because that same rule doesn't apply when you're watching movies and action films. You know what I mean? Like no. rarely will I ever see a regular dude being Captain yeah. America, you know, like, yeah, I, as a matter of fact, I don't want to see it, you know, like I don't want to see is, that. This is the embodied. And, and it's because the way Hollywood works, you heighten reality to the best in, you know, it, it, the best encapsulation of that concept. So whenever yeah. I'm drawing comics, yeah, I could draw, and I, it's not in my nature to draw like regular looking superheroes. I Dude, like snapping it up to 20, 30. You know what I mean? Yeah. Wow. Look at this. This is so cool, man. Thanks, man. This was my my supposed, um, you know, all pinups issue, but I couldn't. It was either going to be all uh, full page flashes or double page flashes, but I couldn't couldn't do it because I still needed to be able to tell yeah. a story. And I think it was critical that I did, you know? Wow. Oh, sexy, man. This is, um, this is beautiful. I feel like you, uh, you leveled up. Over <laughs> Thanks, the course dude. Of time. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is the one where I'm like, why am wow. I rendering the hell out of this? My <laughs> argument to myself, the reasoning, the, the, I was like, well, because it's a it's a splash page and blah blah yeah. blah. But I'm like, I never do it again in this entire uh, in this entire issue. I just yeah. wanted to see for myself that I could do it, but it doesn't add any mm -hmm. any value except for the enjoyment factor, you know. Totally. Yeah. This is so. Here's that scene, right? Where cool. the the idea is that these these flying you know mechs right in full in full whatever in full flight in full whatever you want to call it now has to deal with the imperial guard of this empress that consists of three people of which there is a female lieutenant right and yeah. they just dive headlong into this oh. double page spread of, Damn, uh, of mechs and i i'm i had so much fun drawing it but I also had to apologize to Giuliano and his flatter because <laughs> yeah. once, once they get here, I really hope they understood, or at least they have an inkling yeah. that this is a marathon and not a sprint, you know? No, no. Because that's... we're four issues deep into this thing and I give him a double page spread that looks like that. It's almost like a kick through the balls, you know? That's awesome, man. Wow, look at this. This is just beautiful stuff. Really beautiful Thanks, stuff. Dude. Yeah. So how, how long are these pages taking you to do, Eric, if you don't mind me asking? I, I don't mind. I, I thought, and this, this is a funny anecdote, I thought that because this was going to be an all splash slash double page spread issue, this was going to go by fast, right? Mm -hmm. To the contrary, because oh, yeah. the p images are so much bigger, I have to slow down so much to go in and add the added little bits of rendering that I typically would not do were they like smaller four or five panel sequences. So mm -hmm. this one, I thought I'm going to snap this out so fast. This one took freaking forever. And I can't remember, yeah. take me a day and a half to ink a page, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, 
I came to the same conclusion as well. Uh, sequential pages are definitely faster because let's think about it. Most of the panels are probably going to be headshots or bus shots. Sure. And sure. and you're only going to have rounds here and there, and you know. Yeah, what I mean? yeah. <clears throat> but full page, man, you've got to go all out with some yeah. of this stuff. Yeah, and you. And the other thing is that you've got to land composition. You've yeah. got to land like you know. You got it. It's it's a it's a whole set of problems, not really problems, challenges. I would say that you have to like. There's a bunch of tumblers that you have to turn at a very specific rate when you're doing full page spreads. You know, totally. and this is also an opportunity for me to try out a bunch of new digital brushes on this iPad, which you can see oh, some yeah. of these ink washy ones. The bottom the bottom panel there. I had so much fun um, thinking about how I was going to go execute that bottom panel using that okay, new cool. brush that I had found. You know, so. Are you using those ink brushes for the first time in this issue? Like, do you yeah. worry that that the, <laughs> there's not going to be a certain amount of consistency between this issue and the others, or is it like not that different? That, no, that it's matter? more like it's everything that you said in the beginning. All the worry, all all the anxiety, all the you know, you know, a mindfulness, and obviously like holding myself accountable to this thing that I had I'd set up previously in the first three issues but also I needed to get over it because I still wanted to have fun, right? Yeah, cool. If there was no opportunity for me to sort of like stretch a little bit and experiment mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe somewhere in here, like maybe, I, let's say I tried, I tried 10 things and I don't end up using all but two. That's still two new things that I incorporate back into what my production pre-production looks like, right? But I wanted okay. to give myself that space to be able to do something that I didn't do three issues previous, even if it's just a brush, even if it's just like a rendering style that I was trying, even if it's just like a composition that I would never try, you know? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, this is great, man. I can't is this wait. Is too much? Am I ruining this for you? No, no, you're not. I can't <laughs> wait until the, oh, look at this page. And this, this page, one. damn man, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you went all out. You went all out. So it this was, is it's been four. so much fun. It has been so much fun. And you know what's what really has a tendency to um to reinvigorate me into doing the next page is when um, Giuliano turns in his pages in color because totally. he takes it and he goes like, "Do you think I should try this?" I'm like, Dude, "What are you talking about? Just try it. Worst case scenario, will." We'll walk it back from there. But if you're already sort of, if you were already sort of like, eh, I wouldn't, I, I don't want to do that because it's too, um, it's too destructive to Eric's line or like his lighting or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And like, just try it because we could always go back to the to the other safer version, you know. And we've done that, you know. We've had conversations in which ah, that's a tiny bit too much. It's it, you know, uh, for me, one of the things that what would like, for instance, a page like this, I actively. Um, I engage Juliana to come save my ass because there's so many like odd, uh, you know, shapes. There's so many mm. abstract concepts that are going on here that I need him to bring, bring it back to center so that it's legible to people as to what's happening. You know what I mean? Totally. Um, and, and thankfully he's been so accommodating to that concept in both experimentation, but also pulling my fat out of the fire. <laughs> yeah, totally. Gorgeous. Yeah, man, there's some very complex and intricate panels you've included in here, like this top one, for example. Yeah. Lots of elements, lots of intri intricate details in the spaceship. That's funny that that's what, you know, like I understand where you're coming from on that. But to me, I like my in that entire exercise for this panel, it's just depth. And it's difficult yeah. in multiple ways. Number one. The only thing that you have as a viewer to to sort of grasp onto to be like, oh, I understand how big that is, are the buildings, right? It kind yeah. of sort of you kind of understand what those True. buildings look like and how big they are, and you and that gives you scale. But the moment I start introducing things like this giant Akira ball, you know, this containment field, this containment generator, and you're like, I don't know how big that is, you know, all mm -hmm. I have to all I have as a point of reference are those buildings. Okay, so I guess it's pretty big because next to those buildings is massive. And then you take a look at the spaceship in the far background, and you're like, I have no idea how big that is, right? Because is that yeah. 500 feet away from the buildings? Which, okay, that's pretty big. If it's 5,000 feet, that thing is massive now, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm negotiating 
how important those reads are. And then ultimately yeah. I go like, I just need to get over myself because I have like three other pages after here, you know? Yeah, for sure. And it's funny because I'm not confused at all when I look at this. That then at the end of the day, that's the most important. That's critical. Yeah. If you're if you're looking at it and you go like, I can't tell what the hell's going on. I just, I just showed you a page with a bunch mm -hmm. of abstract shapes all of two minutes ago. And that was hell to try to get through, but it was necessary, right? Um, yeah, and, and like a page like this where you're like, God bless America. There's so many details. And I really hope Jules yeah. comes in there and like highlights all of these guys, you know, or else For everything sure. gets lost. And that's, that's where you need a good colorist. Because, Absolutely. yeah, I, I agree with you. Like there's a lot going on here. I still think that you can definitely appreciate the line art alone. And if you look at it for long enough, you can decipher uh, what's happening. For sure. Um, yeah. Will you, are you going to release a black and white version of your book? Yeah. I was about to segue Good. just into that. There is going to be in the campaign is going to be the standard book. It's hardcover, nice. comic book size, 64 pages in total, some supplemental material in the, in the back, depending on how many um, pages are left over of story versus supplement. It, it's, it shifts between each, each volume, but there is going to be a, an artist edition version of this book. That's all black and white probably nine by 12 in that. size. I'm trying to think of what the logistical issues will be in regards to getting that. Uh, if I go any bigger than nine by 12, because when you see artist editions on the market now, it's typically how um, original pages are are turned in, which is 11 by yeah. 17, right? But, it, but Athena wasn't drawn traditionally. So why am I binding myself to 11 by 17 measurements? That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't add any value to the experience. What adds value, I believe, is the files in its black and white form. So it may be um, more justified if I just keep it at nine, uh, nine and a half by 12. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Look at this. Yeah, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, with keeping it the same size as a, as a regular comic book, mm, you know, mm. the, the black and white version. Um, I, I know people who love digging into pages, though. You know what I mean? Where they're yeah, like, oh, I know. Gosh, look at look how he renders these lines. I, I'm one of those nerds. You know, like, I love yeah. seeing um, Kevin Nolan original pages and understanding how he inks them. You know, mm, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So each of the individual five volumes are what, like over sixty pages? Yeah. Well. Some of them are, well, again, this is all contingent upon uh, Joe Fulton saying, like, you need three or four extra pages here, right? But right. they're averaging around 450, 50 That's pages amazing, each. Man. Yeah. That's so cool. And you'll so be 50 able to- times five, five issues. I've drawn about 200 some odd pages. I'm, I'm about wow. to draw 200 some odd pages. Will you eventually do like a giant, what do they call them, omnibuses? Oh, God. Man, that's way too much. Like that's that is a that is like four D five D chess that you're talking about. <laughs> I'm trying to make the. I'm trying to. I don't want to make your head or anything. Oh man, you're gonna you're gonna make my anxiety shoot through the ceiling. I'm trying to make the problem <laughs> sets smaller and more digestible, yeah. rather than thinking like. And I know it's important. I mean, if if Rob is still in chat, I'm sure he's already like thinking three moves ahead. Oh, you should have this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. you know? The most yeah. I had said to him was that at campaign five we're going to do the tier that allows you to have the slip case that has all five volumes nice. that can beautiful. go inside of them, you know? So I think that's practical and pragmatic, useful, and it, it's in line and on brand for the whole series. But as far as the omnibus is maybe, but there's Something. no immediate plans for it. Yeah. 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 Um, so what is the plan then for the release of each of the books? You're going to put a campaign up for them one by one? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'd reached out, and, and I think it was one of our first conversations. You and me yeah. were like, "Have you ever? Has anyone ever done anything like this?" Right? Like where it's yeah. like not just the one-off, and in such a cadence where it feels like it's going to be almost back to back to back with each other. And I, yeah. did, I don't know of a version of that, or at least too many. There are, there have been, that have been made mention to me, and I'd really appreciate those people's feedback. But. As I dug more into it, the one consistent name that has come up is a fellow by the name of Tim Lim. Do you know Tim at all? He does a book no. called Common America. Okay. And Common America has been coming out with a level of consistency and cadence that made the most sense to me 
in mm -hmm. co in comparison to what's going on. So somebody put me in touch with him, and I and I I'm telling you, dude, I stayed on the phone with that guy for two and a half hours, That's and amazing. I must have said, "Tell me what your playbook looks like." And to his yeah. credit, and to this entire community. So by the way, thank you. Thank you to your fans. Thank you to everybody who's taken the opportunity to give me their, I mean, they're based on their experience. They have given it to me unsolicited and I've taken in, I have taken it in and like, okay, what's useful for me. And in, in because the reason why it's such a big deal for me, number one, because I, I always feel like I'm the guy that kind of like, after you guys have congealed as a group, right? I remember yeah. telling you this, like the first time that I ever ran into your guys' live stream, you guys were talking like you guys were the most comfortable friends of like 15, 20 years, right? <laughs> yeah. And I thought like, I'm the guy that kind of wandered in the back and sat in the back theater or whatever. And suddenly you're like, yeah. hey, what's your name? And I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, so the fact that you guys have sort of, you know, adopted me in that sense and been very, very kind to me, I can't thank you guys enough for that, right? Oh, man. So, similar to, so similar to the, the it's similar to that, I'd come to find out there are people who are just, they would love for your success, Yeah. right? And so they're, they want to give you as much information so that you can make the best informed decision in whatever capacity that you decide to move into and in whatever space that you decide to move into. Tim, you... Tim, you, know, you guys are you guys are those people. And so when I reached out to Tim, again, two and a half hour long conversation, he's like, I'll give you the playbook. And so one That's of the amazing. things that he's, and one of the things that he sent to me, because I was trying to do this, like, we're gonna do this every month and blah, blah, blah. It's like, calm down. Ramp hmm. that, ramp that down. You have how many books? And I told him, and he's like, You have about a year and a half worth of campaigns. A hundred percent agree with him. Right? And I would yeah. have known that. Right. You have a year and a half worth of campaigns built in to how you are, you know, designing the series just by the way you're breaking up the books, just your page, just, yeah. just your page count. And that took, that was great, great insight. And so it's yeah. going to be like that, which is like release the first one, fulfill. And at the end of that fulfillment, start the campaign for issue two. Yeah. And that's the reason when I heard that, I'm like, I'd better shore up fulfillment. And I oh, yeah. better shore up like what these tiers look like so that at the very least, um, people are getting the best value for whatever it is that they're you know, they, what they're supporting me for, right? Yeah. So those were big to me. And and I feel like I'm not going to be able to do fulfillment on my own. So I spent the past month and a half just looking for the individuals who I think can, can do the very best job for the money. Awesome. For yeah. sure. Yeah, that's so awesome, man. Yeah, it's, it's one, it's the most smartest thing you could have ever done is actually do your research, talk to the people who have already done it. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's a major step towards success. But uh, more importantly, I feel like you've got in those 200 pages, the, the making of your business, which is that's a whole funny. new comic book business which is that's really kind of, going to take off in a very right. consistent manner over the course of that time over the course of that thank year and a half thank you and it's weird somebody said like so what do you there's two different questions from two different people they said what how much time are you going to give yourself after you finish the the you know the last pencil or last ink mark on <laughs> five and i said what rest are you talking about i take off that hat and i go into promotion hat you know, yeah. because this is, that's the important part is awareness. You know, you get people totally. out there, you earn their trust, you make them aware of your book and you have to do it consistently for five books straight. For sure. Right? And then the other question that I got was how soon are you going to work on Arc Athena 2? And that I was like, are you out of your effing mind? I don't, I haven't finished one. What makes you think I'm, I'm yeah. on board for two? Because I was explaining to somebody what the plot was. And he's like, holy crap, you went for a, um, alien invasion right away. Yeah. Like, What's the big deal about that? Yeah, goes, but what's wrong with that? Are you not thinking about this in its series? Because you kind of have to build into the alien invasion. Yeah. Right? And I'm all like, no, no. You you do the alien invasion because you establish it to be, you know, you I establish myself as a legitimate creator that can handle that sort of scope. And then mm -hmm. after I I I have sort of the 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 public trust that the buyer trust to be like, man, he really can pull that off, you know, do something else that's in line with the themes that I'm trying to do with these characters. So it, the alien invasion mm -hmm. is just like dressing, you know what I mean? Yeah. But people totally. get caught up in the, in the, in the, in the bombasticness of it. 
Yeah, I, I 100% agree, man. Yeah. yeah, you just, you tackle it. You be brave. You you look at, uh, you look in the face of danger and, and you do what it is you, you really, you really think needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, I, I think just you are doing it the way that really, if I'm being honest, we all should be doing it. Um, and you, you've got like, I mean, uh, somehow you found the resources for you to be able to sit down. And I don't know if you're working on this full time at the moment, but I'm you not. were able to, you're not. Yeah. So you, you were able to sit down part time then yeah. and smash out like up to four issues now, each like over 50 to 60 pages long. Yeah. And now over the next year, year and a half from September onwards, maybe, uh, you're going to be able to just promote this series and make a, an absolutely massive splash. Uh, you, I you, hope so. you've always got, you yeah, you got the guarantee of pretty much not disappointing fans with delays and which, you know, That's we're already one. guilty of essentially with Kozo. Mm. Uh, it, it's tough, man, as an independent, but I think that you've really put the things in place that you need to put into place to to just have one hundred percent security, not just for yourself as a creator, but also your your readers. Yeah, it's it's yeah. awesome, man. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. And in part, I know you you said it kind of tongue in cheekly, and as far as like, oh, we've fallen, we've fallen behind, or we we're late with Kozor, right? And I, it is no small, it is no small um courtesy that you guys have done for me by highlighting how important that is right yeah when you guys are saying dude i'm late and it's it's not a good space to be in when we first started Fine. talking i remember that's one of the first things that between you and i think rob and i ran and i reached out to my good friend um dan fraga he was clear i mean you guys were absolutely transparent man like do not be late yeah. Right, no matter what, and it, that put really the fear of God into me. You know, like okay, that, that's a big deal. Yeah. You know, like of of all the th so, how do I then build the plan so that that doesn't happen? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And it's through your guys' sort of like guidance to say like, hey, we we know how how painful this this space can be if you ever go into it. So mm -hmm. if you can, dude, do not go anywhere near there. Right. And so yeah. I took that to heart, and that's that's one of the things where I'm like, okay, I could probably. I could probably rest tomorrow. I could probably like take this week off, you know, but I didn't want to be late. Right. The guys yeah. have been telling me I shouldn't be late. So I'm deathly afraid of it. Man, so thank you. I just admire the dedication and that uh, the determination you have because it would be so easy to rest after the yeah. amount of work you've already done on it. Yeah. It'd be so easy to rest on issue five. But uh, but you're going all the way through to the end. You're resisting the temptation to start your campaigns any earlier than that's done. Yeah, and, uh, it's yeah. I've heard it's I've admirable. Heard the, I've heard. Thank you. I've heard like the entire thing. Hey, launch it now. You have two issues in the can. Yada yada yada. I'm like, nope, nope. Five issues. I'm st I'm sticking yeah. to that number. Once all five are done on the black and white, and I start doing campaigns. You know, like For I sure. start. Hopefully, issue. Well, no, it's not. Hopefully. Juliana knows we don't launch until you are somewhere near finish with issue one. Yep. Absolutely, right? man. And then it goes on to sure. whether it goes on to Weather's desk, who I'm who I trust implicitly because that guy is a consummate professional. There's a reason why he's busy. I don't know how Weathers does everyone's books and still manage to draw Battle Brick Road. Yeah, he's uh I, I well right? he he's he was in the chat just before. Um yeah. right there. And yeah. uh, he he's still drawing it, I think. I know, but I don't know. Mind yeah, I don't know either. Mind boggling. Yeah, it's it's one of those funny things, man. And absolutely, you don't want to end up in that space where you're delayed. And it's not just because uh, you're making the the backers wait. That's a negative for sure. But it's sure. also for your own sanity as a creator, like. Our ambition is very much the same as yours. We want to put out a series of books, not just one sure, book. Sure. And and when it and when we see you putting out four or, or getting four or five books penciled up in a year, yeah. And we're not even through one of those our issues yet. It's like 
envy inducing man because <laughs> you, you've got a whole freaking you can have you know, a book set now i You're remember right. what yeah i remember one of the one of the more exciting parts about being sort of welcomed into your guys's group is it harkened mm-hmm. back to when i was still trying to break into the comic book industry this must have been like mid 90s you know mid to late 90s mm-hmm. and i had a group of friends who were all so motivated to get into that space into mainstream yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. I, you know, after just seeing how the sausages were made, I was less involved, less interested in doing anything mainstream. But after seeing, again, this was like right around the time that the pandemic wall came down. Yes. And I was kind of stuck at home, just kind of like watching on, oh, I wonder what's happening on, in the world of independent comics because I don't care too much about mainstream. And then you guys got auto recommended to me. And I thought, oh, cool. like, man, these guys feel like what it felt, these guys are talking and conducting themselves the way my friends used to conduct themselves when we were trying to make our own stuff, right? That's awesome. it, doesn't, it didn't matter that it was like independent. It was just like the the sort of the, the you know, the froth inducing sort of passion for it. Hell yeah. You know, so the more I sat in, sat in in the back, kind of like not trying to draw attention to myself, I'd like, man, these guys are just into it. They really, really love it. They really want to draw these books. And that was one of the the seeds that got planted into me to go like, I wonder if I still have it in me to, you know, to to draw a, a book, a, to draw a no series. Way, so man. when That's it started, awesome. it was just literally like what the 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 path that you guys had forged previously was, you know, it, it, 64 pages or whatever the page count was, right? And yeah. then I thought, like, what can I do to challenge myself? Yeah. Right. Well, he did and it. Then, right. And but but to your point earlier, which is like when you saw when you see when you see the pages, it kind of like inspires you. And in a way, like these may not be your words, but it kind of lights the fire under you to go like, dude, I, I want to I want to get to that. Right. But seeing you guys do it, it became this sort of like internal internal competition in my own head to be like, what can I do that's one step higher than that? Mm-hmm. right Hell and yeah, so man. to, to that end like that's a, that's the healthiest kind of you know and you guys weren't involved in that competition because you didn't know me from adam but certainly it was like yeah. man if i could do it i would do this and eventually i just said shut up let's just let's just go try and it that's just happened to be that you know you were like hey man come and hang out and i was like this is so freaking cool i feel oh, wow. like I'm back in that space again you know so you had you had been watching us before uh, we actually got you on the show and reached out. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, man, was, I didn't know that. Yeah, I just kind of, you know, I I hear you. I'd see you guys beat up on like Corey so much. <laughs> yeah. As he was coloring or drawing something, and I was like, they have to love each other, right? They, they have to be like yeah. really, really close friends to be that sort of. You know, you do that to the people that you care about the most, right? You're yeah. you're critical of them, but if somebody were ever to come into that space and be that critical and that open and sort of that abrasive, you'd be overprotective of that guy, right? So right. I was like, man, that's a great that's a great brotherhood, you know. Man, and so he's... it was. And the best part is that he's got the chin for it. That kid he does and he's good to me, right? Like, it, like in, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm 75 years old compared to that guy, but like, he's like, no, I'm going to try this and I'm going to try this and I'm going to try this. Like everything that you guys were throwing at him. And I thought like, yeah, man, that's what you need in order yeah, to man. get better at anything. You just have to be tenacious, strong in the chin and just try everything until you figure stuff out. So my admiration and respect to you guys, but mostly that kid who's like, yeah, I can take yeah. that punch. Oh man, he would appreciate that. He he credits you actually to to help him helping him out big time with with his coloring. Oh, that's incredible. And he has been really working hard to level yeah. up his abilities in that area and become yeah. one of the best colorists out there. In my opinion, it's, He's it's a challenge, really but if you just head down and focus on where you're where you're deficient, right, and shore yeah. all of that up, dude, it's 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 he's fine. He's perfect. He got the he got the best attitude for it. He does. Um, now uh, we, we'll probably wrap this up in just a yeah. few minutes. Yeah. I wanted to just share this quickly because I was intrigued about what it is you <laughs> just posted up here on your Twitter. Yeah, what? this looks yeah, so, amazing. Thank you so much. So one of the things, and I think this was, I'm telling you, I get I get put into this into this. Um, headspace of dread when it comes to like, this is how you make your campaign successful. 
And I think it was Rob. If Rob is still in the chat, he's to blame for this. And also to credit. Yeah. <laughs> but he was like, you know, you got to get your email list sorted out, don't you? And I was like, what? Yep. E what's an email list? You know? Oh, and he yeah. told me it's a great communication tool. It's a great awareness tool for people who are interested in your product, interested in your projects, and be able to reach out to them and say, hey, this is available. Come and, you know, come and support me. These are the things that you can do. But there's also an opportunity to incentivize that participation in order to get them mm -hmm. into your newsletter, your email list, your basically your distribution list for what's available. And this is my way of incentivizing that, right? Which is to say, hey, from between now, it's J June 2nd, right? So at the end of June, we are gonna draw a, like, let's assume for a minute, there's a hundred people who signed up, right? It's just a roundabout number. Like, so out of a hundred people, at the end of June, we're going to pick one person out of that hundred and send them a copy of this prototype. Say thank you very much for your for your participation in signing up for this list, signing up for my newsletter. We take the remaining ninety nine and move them into July. And now there's a, let's say we had another hundred in July, so now there's one hundred ninety nine. Out of one hundred ninety nine, we pick one more and we send out another one of these to say thank you so much, right? And whatever else that's left Amazing. over into August, end of August, we send the third one out and say. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all of your support, for believing enough in this project to, to sign up for this newsletter. And then we launch in September. Cool. This is actually just the prototypes for them. We're going to have the busts, knock on wood, we're going to have the bus manufactured as a tier in the campaign. I hope so, man. I, yeah. How did you get them to look this good? You're, are you, you're hiring a third party company, are you? I am. So what I did was design the statue. I drew the front side and back version of it. We had a back and forth, I had a back and forth with a, a 3D sculptor, a friend, uh, excuse me, a friend of mine recommended them. And nice. yeah, it was really super easy. I'd say, hey, touch this up here and make this a little bit more prominent and what have you. And then from there, we just sent it out to uh, the printer. That is incredible, man. And three of really, those came really back just, just yesterday, you know. You must, looking at the volume of work you've done on the comic book, seeing this bust, you must feel all sorts of proud of what you've managed to accomplish. You know what's strange? I've compartmentalized my emotions until the end. Yeah. So I look at it and I don't look at it in a sense of like pride for myself, but I'm incredibly yeah. proud of the people who have worked on it. Right, so. because it shows their level of craft that I wouldn't know to do for myself. Mm -hmm. So when I yeah. see it turn out, I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a reason why those guys are who they are, you know, and do what they do because they do it so dang well, you know. Hell yeah. So if, if, if anything else, it's that I give full credit to the guys who are producing this stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Um, Thanks, man. Casual artist us is is this live or pre recorded? It's live, man. <laughs> We're doing this live. All right. So, yeah, just to wrap up, I've got to highly recommend, and we have a link to this in the description below. Everybody check out Eric Canetti's website at ericcanetti.com. Mm -hmm. uh, there you're going to be able to see all of his brilliant and beautiful work. You know, I mean, it speaks for itself, really, doesn't Thank it? You. Could look at this. And if you, yeah. I don't know if it's already happened for you, man, but like, if you ha if you stick around enough, the actual prompt for the um, newsletter yeah. will pop up for you. And More once that happens, that's that. where you can put all of your information. You get you get immediately um, uh, allocated your email immediately gets uh, put into our our basically pull. You know, or you can go into that Arcathena info and, and put your information there as well. So either way. Thank you. Yeah, definitely sign up to the email list. That's that's going to be the best way to find out more information about Arcathena. It's the easiest way for Eric to be able to communicate with you about any updates or, you know, wh what is happening with the project. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the first place that you want to be. Get on the list yeah. and, uh, and you won't miss out on any of those updates. Man, it's been an absolute blast hanging out yeah. with you. Two Thanks. hours. Holy crap. Thank you for having me on that long, just chit-chatting craft, dude. That's so awesome. No, you're welcome. Like, it's like I always say, it's it's so easy to talk with you. It's fun to discuss this stuff. You know, I don't have that many people that I can get into the, get deep on the art with, sure. other than Corey, you know, when he comes sure, over. Sure. We're in lockdown again over here. So, Are you really? Think, yeah, yeah, man. That's some, unfortunate, man. I'm sorry. I'm South Australian came over to Victoria and 
Infected Shut the whole everybody. place down again. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's all good, though. It's all good. Us Thanks for your time, man. Thank you so much. You stay healthy. Yeah, and for sure. You, for you too, man. On. You're very, very welcome to the chat. Thanks so much for tuning thank in you, today. Everybody. We hope that you got a lot of value out of uh, out of our wonderful interview with Eric. Till next time, look after yourselves, and we'll catch you in the next stream. Bye bye. Bye.